wonderful airplanes were produced. I mean, like the ones that spring to my mind as the superb airplanes of World War II on the British side are, of course, inevitably Spitfire and the Mosquito and the Lancaster. These are the three that stand out in my mind. I flew them all enormously amount of time, and I thought they were absolutely splendid aeroplanes. There is no doubt about it. Germans, of course, <coughs> could match us. They had three brilliant aeroplanes on their side. They had the Focke Wolf 190. They had the Ju-88. And, of course, the outstanding aircraft of World War II, the Messerschmitt 262. When I say outstanding, I mean the most formidable. But, of course, it, outstanding is probably not the right word, because it never was allowed to get to its full potential, because <clears throat> it wasn't built in big enough numbers. It was also wrongly used for the first year of its life because Hitler dictated it should be used as a fighter bomber instead of a pure fighter. And then when it did come into its own as a fighter, Germany was out of experienced pilots that could handle this machine. Now, the Focke-Wulf 190 was a delightful airplane in every sense of the word. It barely had a fault. It had a, a fairly vigorous stall, but apart from that, it was almost as um, perfect as the, the Spitfire. Kurt Tank was the producer of the 190. I'm a bit surprised that in the three German aircraft you name as outstanding, you don't mention the 109. No, I don't. I didn't think... I think the 109 um, succeeded because, in spite of itself, it <clears throat> was not a nice airplane, particularly nice airplane to fly. Many Germans will tell you it was. But, of course, if you fly an airplane long enough, you begin to know it's there and you accept it. But you have to realize, as a test pilot, I was able to compare it with a vast range of aircraft. And I certainly did not ever think it was a great aeroplane. I think it was um, a wonderful workhorse in the war as a fighter aircraft, but um, its problems were it had some nasty handling characteristics, um, which were a disadvantage in combat. It was a very claustrophobic aeroplane to fly, tiny cockpit, and it was not an easy aeroplane to land in bad weather or anything like that um, because the view was terrible. And altogether, it had, as I said, it was not the same class as the Focke Wolf 190. <clears throat> what was so good about the 190? Well, the 190 was a beautiful aircraft to handle, magnificent to fly and manoeuvre. It... Um, was very fast for a piston engine aircraft and it had nice characteristics even to fly in bad weather. One must realize that in Europe you have to account, take into account very closely <clears throat> what an aeroplane can do in bad weather because the continent of Europe is not blessed with the weather for example, that you find in the Gulf of Mexico. And this the Americans found much to their cost when they came to Europe first. So you have to assess an airplane in that respect. <clears throat> and that's why I say the Focke Wolf was a much nicer airplane to deal, handle in bad weather than the 109. You had specific designers, of course, whom we met frequently at Farnborough, brilliant men in this country too, like Sir Sidney Cam of Hawkers, and um, many of these people were so easy to talk to. They, were, they related well to test pilots, all of them. This was the, the thing I found quite fascinating. 
And interestingly enough, <clears throat> I found absolutely the same when I went to Germany after the war. I mean, once we, we'd we captured a lot of these people like Kurt Tank of Focke Wolf, Willy Messerschmitt, Dr. Heinkel, I found them very easy to talk to because they could relate to pilots. So Sidney Cam was one of these people who had a wonderful eye for aesthetic form. He could sketch his idea on a piece of paper rapidly, and it always had these smooth, flowing lines which made you realize that the aircraft looked so good you felt it must fly right. He, so Sidney didn't suffer fools gladly, um, but he was a man who has been working under pressure most of his life, pressure of war, etc., to produce the goods, and he always did. It was wonderful in that respect. The other great designer, of course, was um, Mitchell of Supermarines, who again, unfortunately, died at an early age, but a man much in the same stamp as Sir Sidney Cam, uh, who produced the most magnificent Spitfire, of course. And uh, I didn't ever meet Mitchell, but I, I knew his successor well, Joe Smith. <coughs> but Joe's job was mainly developing the Spitfire so that it could achieve or keep up with the opposition throughout the war. As you know, many, many marks and models of Spitfire were built, each of them going faster or going higher or having more armament, etc. That was Joe Smith's task, and he did it brilliantly. So we had the right men in the right places. Kurt Tank, I think, was the man that I would put on a par with R.J. Mitchell. He was the chief designer for Focke Wolf. Now, he was a remarkable man in many ways because not only was he the chief designer, he did all the initial flights in his own designs. Um, so he was a qualified test pilot and, and he was really very highly thought of. Very, very fertile brain. And of course, he produced some magnificent Aircraft, uh, Focke Wolf 190. Uh, the 262 was Woolly Messerschmitt's, but Woolly Messerschmitt, I would put in the same category as Tank in the sense that um, 262 was a way ahead of its time. It had sweep back, of course, much of that information came out of the um, German research establishments as opposed to out of the, the aircraft's own. Um, research department, so to speak. It came out of the national resource as opposed to the company resource. And a lot done at Brunswick, but mostly done at Göttingen. Uh, and the 262 had a lot of design carry, often control and stability characteristics that were masked by its marvelous performance. But it wasn't really a beautiful aeroplane to fly in some ways. It had problems, and um, it could be a very lethal machine, for example, if one had an engine failure on takeoff. Uh, when you go on to the bomber side, I think the, um, the Junkers team, we didn't have much to do with them, of course, because most of them were trapped in the, um, the Russian zone after the war. Dr. Heinkel, I spoke to quite a lot. Um, strange, interesting man, because, as you know, he was a Jew, and he was preserved because, I presume, of his usefulness to the, um, the regime. But uh, he had a lot of administrative troubles, probably because of the aspect. Uh, but he, he did design some very fine aircraft, some research aircraft, the very first jet, of course, that ever flew was um, Heinkel's. Uh, he had a disastrous aircraft, of course, in the Heinkel 177, 
But that was designed not so much under the age, direct ages of Heinkel as under a consortium of designers who were working for his firm. And he was very scathing himself about this particular aircraft. Um, but the, I would say if Germany's real, real strengths lay in their research establishments, like Göttingen, as I say, in Brunswick, this is where the real power lay. Um, just as much of the power of this country, of course, lay in the RE Farbra. Uh, if you were in any trouble or any stage of the design process, you had to come to Farbra, which was the fount of all knowledge, really, in this country for anything aeronautical. Pure, from pure pleasure point of view, yes. Uh, I've often thought of this. I would say, without any question in my mind, the de Havilland Hornet. Uh, because it was a beautiful, instinctively beautiful shape. And I say instinctively, when you approach an airplane, you get this feeling it's right or it's wrong. And it just looked right. It's a lot of airplane in the sense that one man sits in it. But... It has that rare quality, which so often is missing in aircraft. It was overpowered. This was delightful to such an extent that um, I used to give aerobatic shows uh, in this aircraft and do the whole show on one engine and eventually do a loop with both feathered. It was that type of airplane. It was very, very streamlined, very, very fast. And if you dived it down, obviously at full power, when I say you do a loop, both fell at why I must describe what I mean. You dive it at absolutely full power towards your point where you're going to start the pull up. Just before you pull up, you feather. So you, as you just come out of the bottom, you're in the feathering process. And by the time you begin to pull up into the vertical, you, you are actually feathered on both. And it, you have enough inertia there to carry you right through the loop with no problem at all. And as soon as you've crossed over the top and on the way down, you're on feather. And you carry a spare fuse and you're handy in your pocket in case <laughs> you blow the fuse on the feathering motor. Otherwise, you've got a problem. But it was that type of airplane. Delightful. I wouldn't say it had the um, perfect harmony of control, but it had very good harmony of control. I think this is what makes a pilot love an airplane. There's real beautiful harmony of control. And you had no uh, torque reaction problems with the, the engines? No, because they were handed, you see. Yeah. Yes, each went in the opposite direction. This was another point, of course. You could, um, there was no takeoff swing, no landing swing, anything like that. Magnificent view, which is only, it was only equal later by jets, of course, which tend to have a very good view anyway. Um, but for um, a propeller airplane, quite unique. They were just sitting between the two engines there and right on the very, the very nose. I must say it was a beautiful looking year. Oh, absolutely superb, yes. I think it's a shame they haven't preserved any. I don't know of any... I don't know. I don't, no, quite well. honestly, yes. Uh, Another very, what I always consider a very beautiful airplane, but it never went into production, was the Martin MB-5, Martin Baker 5. Beautiful fighter uh, aircraft. But it just arrived too late at um, the end of the war. What about the worst? How Without, the yes, again, I haven't much doubt in saying I think the the GAL-56, this tailless glider, um, which really I thought was a highly dangerous aircraft in the sense that it was difficult to get off the ground at all. It exhibited um, quite violent trim change characteristics when one was trying to take it off. It was the wing was so close to the ground as it drooped that it, there was a marked ground effect. In other words, the, as you accelerated, the air was being cushioned between the runway and the wing. As soon as you pulled out of this cushion, you got a violent change of trim. And it tended to dive you straight back into the runway. And in fact, often I've had the stick on the back stop, absolutely nothing further to go, and just praying that it wouldn't hit the runway. Um, and once you got through that situation, 
your that was just the beginning of your troubles. Um, the type of testing we were doing, we did a lot of stalling, had a very violent self-induced stall, so that when you began to pull the nose up, it reached an instance at where it then took charge of the situation itself. And even if you pushed the stick onto the dashboard, you couldn't counteract this. It reared itself up to quite an alarming de- um, angle. It doesn't sound much, but uh, I'm talking about angles of 14, 15 degrees probably, which are fairly alarming in there at that um, at a stall, because the normal stalls round about the sort of 11 degree mark within this order. Um, and it then, when you felt, you really did feel you were going right over onto your back, it would suddenly unstall very violently and drop into a vertical position, nose down. So there was a fair amount of being thrown about in the cockpit going on. And then when you had the landing situation, you had, of course, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, you had the same, in the landing uh, situation, of course, you had to reverse the takeoff. You had the ground effect coming in again, just when you were holding off. And uh, thank you. And you felt that <laughs> all set for nice landing. You would suddenly get this violent change of trip occurring. And uh, it could be a terrible mess of the final result. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, the self-stalling characteristics were so violent that when we returned it um, to general aircraft, we understood when we got it steadily that they hadn't stalled it to that date. <laughs> but we gave them a very, very full report on what was involved. Now, they had, as a test pilot at that time, a very famous... <laughs> glider pilot called Kronfeldt, Paul, a man who had a great reputation in the gliding world. And um, he went up, I think, from Lasham and intending to repeat some of these stalling characteristics, fully aware of our report, etc., but got into tr- some sort of trouble and, um, and there was a fatal accident, I'm afraid. So, in many ways, it was... Um, a repeat story of the DH-108 on a smaller scale. Mm. 